born. After all, her parents were Eddie Fisher and Debbie Reynolds. By the time she was 21, she was starring in one of the biggest blockbusters of all time, Star Wars. Her other films include The Blues Brothers, Hannah and Her Sisters, and When Harry Met Sally. Also an accomplished author, her debut novel, the semi-autobiographical Postcards from the Edge, was a New York Times bestseller. And the recording of her one-woman play, Wishful Drinking, earned her a Grammy nomination. There have also been the darker moments, struggles with drug addiction, and an ongoing battle with bipolar disorder. But her wit and humor have carried her through it all. Hello, I'm Ernie Manoos. Coming up on interviews, our conversation with actress, novelist, and screenwriter, Princess Leia herself, Carrie Fisher. I would never have thought it would be as weird. I think I would have thought like other people thought. Like, oh, she grew up in a nice house with a <laughs> pretty tricycle and help. And I suppose from a certain angle it looked like that. I don't know. But I don't know. I don't know what kind of book we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Well, when you say weird, do you see your life as having been weird? I've talked to other people who have grown up in unique circumstances but that's the only circumstances they know. So when do you realize it's not what everybody else is living? Uh, early on, I did what everybody did. I looked to TV for where the reality was. <laughs> and uh, I, I knew it wasn't like Father Knows Best. So that was my standard. And uh, that, that wasn't happening. It, but it wasn't just the fact that no one was calling me princess yet <laughs> and pulling me onto their lap. Uh, it was the fact that they lived in a house, and it was there was a couple, and there was a family, and so I, it wasn't like that. But I would, th I think most people that I've met did the, that are my age. Yeah. Looked at Father Knows Best and found themselves wanting. So when do you realize though that yours was a unique situation? You know, it's not well, Father Knows Best. Everyone's is unique. Uh, you mean in the in the show business yeah. way? Well, it came in stages. There wasn't like, you know, a moment where it was, look where I, how did I get here? But I always did have the feeling of being an observer. So I always watched it. And other people were watching. So yeah. I was just watching from the outside, from the inside out. I had read somewhere that you never wanted to write an autobiography. That you, the back when you were doing Postcards from the Edge and writing from that point of view, the fictionalized accounts. Yeah, there's so much more it. freedom in that. So why did you? I didn't actually. I wrote the show. Wishful so Drinking. There was no book. And it isn't It isn't a memoir. I mean, it isn't like, so I was born, and then these were my <laughs> first three years, and then I went to school. And, uh, I, you know, I did the show. And, and the show was sort of based on, it, it kind of sprang out of me giving awards to all these people, like, you know, and I would give my mother, uh, George Lucas, I was giving Meryl awards for a while. You know, there was just, and then I now I get mental illness awards, you know, mentally ill human of the year. So it literally, there was material. I was giving Elizabeth Taylor awards. I thanked her for getting my father out of the house. So <laughs> it just became that. It became you know, sort of material. And it's safer if you think of your life as material. Yeah. But then you took the stage show and wrote the book. Y yeah. It, the, the stage show, was it was written. It was there. So I just had to fatten it for the book. Yeah, because it doesn't literally right. translate from one format like, a, like that to another. Was it harder to explain to people the show, the book, than it was when you did the postcards from the edge and it was fictionalized? Did people take one easier than the other well the thing is there's sort of a, a barrier when you write fiction that, that they of course they know a lot of it's autobiographical but uh you know there's there's stuff that is not and you can go i found it was easier for me to go much more sort of internal and emotional write emotionally than uh than i could if i'm writing first person memoir i'm not 
I like the distance. Uh -huh. I like being the observer who looked from the inside out. So that's how I wrote this. Yeah. When you script doctor, when you move in and you look at somebody else's work and you're going to spruce it up, do you feel you have total freedom or do you have to be... Never. No, not in the neck. In that situation, you're there to respect the original writer's voice. Yeah. And you're there to service the uh, director's needs. And generally, you know, when I came on to those scripts, um, there was usually an actor already in place, so then you're, you're writing for that person, you know. And I was usually brought on to do a particular thing, which was to make the love scenes better and the women smarter. <laughs> so um, I had a lot of fun doing that until I came to the end of that. Yeah, why did you come to the end of that? Well, it... Oops. Oh, here's my electric cigarettes. I should probably explain that before it looks any weirder. <laughs> They're both cigarettes. This one is a new one that I got in New York that really is way too much like one. Mm. Mm. It ended... Just a moment. Okay. Mm. It ended because everyone wanted... It. it just was a job that was so inflated and... I never wanted to do it to begin with, and it was Spielberg that got me to do it uh, after I wrote postcard for the movie of Postcards, and so I'm sort of, that's my audition piece, to sort of say, look, I can write dialogue. So he got me doing it, and I was working on Hook for so long that I took another job to get, that was the only way to get off it, not that it was a bad thing, <laughs> but I was working also not being really paid. Right. Stephen gave me his car. Well, that's a nice payment. <laughs> All of it was fun like that. It was like this yeah. amazing, I think that's the only time that I, I got into show business, like probably other people do, you know, like, how did I get here? Who said there was a job <laughs> like this? Wow. Because I was intimidated by it, you know. Uh, I, I'd written that one script, yeah. you know, and so, but I really liked working on dialogue and I used to fool around with my own but that's entirely different where they're at now with they always there's new writers now and there's always someone that just wrote that great script and they're going to get him to do it and otherwise it started to be well the director uh, and the producer want to meet you and they want you for it but they just want you to come in and pitch what you would do mm -hmm. and then it was beyond pitching they want you to write down you know basically and then they don't hire you. Right. So they've gotten you to work already. Well, you know, I think I was overpaid. Anybody's overpaid doing that job. But I, there's some got to be something between overpaid and free. <laughs> so here I am. And this is between it. Here we are, yeah. Do you miss doing it, though? The, the I actual actually did work it last itself. week. <laughs> okay, oh, so then you're still doing it. No, I still do this stuff now and again. I just was doing it all the time then. Yeah. So I seem to go, I, I do everything sort of like a, do it to death or not at all. Okay, a lot of people would assume that you would become an actress. That seemed a, a rightful path for you to go. And you, you did a couple memorable roles that people might remember you from. What fascinates me is the writing. Where did that voice come from? And when did you realize you had that talent? Mm. I didn't go after it like a talent. Uh, when I started reading books, and part of it was I was trying to please my dad. And my dad had told me, oh, there's this writer named uh, Arthur Rambeau. And, you know, so I'm 16, 15 years old, and I'm reading The Drunken Boat. Um, <laughs> but I started reading books, and I fell in love with words. So I, and I'll still do, uh, you know, you read books. That's why I don't like the Kindle and stuff. I like to underline it and mess it all up and mark off. And so I started to do that, uh, and I just loved words, and I loved the voices that, you know, different writers had, different characters had, and, uh, and it was a whole world that you could slip into, and it was a world that would organize around you, and it would work out, whether it's a happy ending or not. It's this, you know, beginning, middle, and end, and th there's this journey that you're going to go on. And it, and it was just very emotional, and it would, I could lose myself in it. So for yeah. me, books were my first drug, 
So, um, you know, I got into dealing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you find things that you wrote during certain periods of your time, when you go back and read them, you can remember the time, the times that you might have been having health issues and troubles, and then you go back and read it, it can take you back there. Yes, yes. I mean, not all the way back to the troubles, but sometimes. I mean, I was looking at something. It's sort of like an archaeolog archaeological dig, you know, uh, you go and you, I took notes on some of the stuff, right? I would take notes on fights I was having, and there would be certain things I would say, you're trying to capture it, you know, like yeah. people that put pins in butterflies. Uh, so I, a lot of what I did, I would probably split in half, you know, what I was doing was preserving things that had happened already, and imagining other outcomes of things that had happened and hadn't worked out like I wanted. Yeah. I want to take you back. You, you mentioned your father, and in almost every interview I see, they talk about your mom and your father and Elizabeth Taylor and the whole situation that went on there. But from looking at it, you were two years old when that happened. Did the outside world, have we put more significance yeah. on that than your family oh, ever oh, did? Oh, on that drama? Yeah. Or was the that The drama as it out? affected me much more. I mean, I was literally described by Andrew... Not Anderson Cooper. What's that guy's name? The interviewee person that's come with an English accent. To Piers CNN. Morgan. Yes. He said, now we're going to have Elizabeth Taylor's stepdaughter. And I was like, <laughs> well, I guess, but that was about 50 years ago, literally. And I don't remember. I only me remember meeting her at that time, a couple of baby. So, uh, you know... In terms of how it impacted me, it impacted me just because it was a woman that my father left my mother for. Right. But the rest of it, you know, it's just like having something happen in your neighborhood, I suppose. Only my neighborhood was a lot of the world. Yeah. But it's funny how it has so defined the story of you, and yet it was such a small part, truly, of your life experience. Well, but, it, you know, it affected everything. Yeah. I mean, it affects the kind of men you're going to go after are going to be the ones that disappoint you. Or you're going to read the situation that way because that's what you know how to do. Yeah. When do you come to that realization? <sighs> after a few relationships. Yeah. <laughs> no, actually, very early on, if you look at stuff that I've written, as I, like 16, I wrote, um, I, I, I'm, love for me is a long-lasting longing for someone whom I cannot quite touch. I'm at 15 years old, wow. so don't offer me love. I seek dis disinterest and denial. 15. So I was already abstracting things, and I was already, I was ab clinically observing it, and that's what language did for me. That was, people ask if it's therapeutic. It puts it into kind of this math, this verbal math, and it just kind of, I don't know, pr it preserves it. Then you have a, a little role, Princess Leia. Right. So much fame and attention comes with it. Right. Is that good for a person like you, do you think? Mm, I don't know what's good for a person like me. <laughs> I know what's bad, probably. But even that, from a certain slant. Um, I, look, it would have been a neater trick for me to get out of show business than to do what happened, which was to just kind of stay in. I didn't want to be an actress. I watched what it did to people's lives the kind of trying to hold on to it as it slips away. It is organized to disappoint. Well, it's organized just to fade. You know, yeah. nothing can stay that way. The physics of it are against you. And, uh, and I knew that, and I'd watched it, and I knew what it would do. I knew it would dial down. You know, you don't like getting old anyway. Try doing it in front of everyone. Right. You're not allowed to get old, get fat, get trouble you know it's all magnified and you know you're already magnified anyway I mean I was brought up by focus pullers I like to say so <laughs> you know we're designed more for public than private or public is a private is public I mean there's no boundaries and I want to get back to Star Wars but I do want to say when you say and you get fatter and you gain weight you look great you have lost a lot somebody of took a picture of me recently this is like and has put it online. Oh, 
Carrie's gained weight. And then I was asked to go on like, <laughs> so actually this is a scoop for you. This is me fat. <laughs> And they got a really bad picture of me, printed it, and you want to go, also, in the picture it says I'm 55. So you have an expectation that I should look like whom? Look like what at 55? So, anyway, that uh, they do that stuff, which is, you know, it's painful. Yeah. Is it harder, do you think, to lose weight or to avoid substances? Because I think a lot of people don't realize how difficult food addictions can be. Uh, uh, substances. Substance. Oh, actually, yeah. <laughs> substances yeah, I mean, I can eat something, but once I've swallowed it, it's over. With a drug, you swallow it, and you're just starting. Uh, Depending. Your alcohol, you know, it's it, it lasts longer, but you don't say stone forever, whereas with food, it's like a, it's a high right then, and then you're fat forever. <laughs> <laughs> When, and I've heard you talk now about what, some of the treatments you're doing, and you're doing, it's not electroshock therapy anymore, it's called, but uh, ECT. Mm -hmm. What exactly is that? Because like you say often, people think it's like one flew over the cuckoo's nest. They just put it in this show that they're doing now uh, on one of the cable shows, Homeland. They showed Claire Danes with a rubber ball in her mouth, and, all, and it's like, it's. I think that stuff's... I don't know. It, it's it's got so much stigma anyway, and and certainly that's never been. An, they put you to sleep, so you're not feeling pain there's or nothing. anything. Nothing, and you don't. They, there's a medication, of course, now that they've given, that that there is no convulsion. So it's it's not even accurately named any longer. Yeah. And what happens in the process? What is it doing when these shocks it hit your brain? It does fast. Uh, what medication does slow? I mean, it just. I always had the sensation of it, you feeling like you're kind of stuck. You're, it, it just kind of like takes out the, um, I don't know, not waiting for the ice to melt so you shatter some of it down. You have to really be in a situation where, you know, I had tried everything else. Right. And so, but it's a shame that I didn't know about it sooner. So then you have to literally wait till what? I'm suicidal. Right. Not that I was, but, you know, that's my line in postcards is, you have very suicidal behavior. Well, my behavior might be, but I'm certainly not. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I waited for a really long time because of all that. Yeah. Is that in place now of other medications, or do you have to take it with other medications? Nothing's ever in place. It always kind of travels along the way. I'm interested in maybe sometimes seeing what's, under, what's yeah. behind the curtain. Do you ever feel that you are, and I hate to use the word, so please, but healed? Does it ever get fixed? That's never been a goal of mine. That's a very dramatic goal. But my life, you accept things more. So you're not yeah. looking for healing. You're looking for, you're looking to appreciate things in your life. I have so much to be, you know, uh, uh, grateful for. I can't even find the word. Um, <laughs> but so that. I look at things differently now. So yes, in a way, in a way, I was never healed, and I always was, depending on my slant. You know, there were so many things I always had that I didn't really appreciate because I was looking what I didn't have. So, does the woman show give you an opportunity to clean house in some ways, to let old stories go because now you've put them out in this way, or not? No, I think that's everyone's fantasy. It's like, I get asked certain questions, and it's, they're sort of, when did you stop beating your wife questions? Uh, you know, like, do you ever get sick of the Star Wars questions? Well, you just answer that. You know what I mean? The, right. the question is, you get sick of it, don't you? Yeah. I mean, so they, um, and I think it was heal the observing in general. Once we get, I get it into the math state of, I want to put it the exact way. I want to put it the best way, but I want to put it really, make you clearly see what I feel, and which was not clear to me for so long. Why do you think it's important to share that, though? Why what? do you think there's an audience that comes to see it? Well, I think a lot of people have a lot, of, you know, everybody, you don't, no one's sort of smoothly walking through their lives with, <laughs> or if they are, Please come talk to me. Who are you? Uh, but I did think that that was what adulthood was. I looked yeah. at people when I was a little kid, especially at parties, and that's what I thought alcohol and adulthood was. <laughs> 
So it wasn't like that. Yeah. But um, I think people, you know, people, we have an introspective experience. I mean, I do, so I assume everybody does. Yeah. But I guess there are people that don't. Maybe Jeff, <laughs> that play golf. I don't know. But I just think we're all more alike each other than not. Or certainly, you know, there's a tribe of, of people, and I think it's comfortable yeah. to be able to relate to people, especially on issues that you don't often talk about because that's the way our culture has been organized. Do you find there's things you can't bring up in the show? That when you were putting it together, there were some areas you just, either for your own personal... It's, it, not sorry. for me, but f for other people, yes. Yes, I mean, well, because when you can claim something, I say it in the show, it has far less power over you. If I can say it like this, and the, the thing was with all these things, I didn't come out and go, hey, look, I'm a car accident, I'm mentally... It was out. So if it's going to be out, then I'm going to put it my way. Yeah, you know, so you get to I'd own rather, it. Well, it's already out. So right. if you had, there was gossip about you on the playground, in the cafeteria, wherever, don't you want to get a hold of it and say, no, no, but it was this way. Right. Okay, so that's my whole experience here. No, it was this way. <laughs> this is what happened. Yeah. Talking about how things happen, you and your mom seem to get along now. We better, because we live in the same... Yeah, you live next door to each other? Mm -hmm. How is that? It's great. We're both really too old to run into each other that often. <laughs> There's a big hill between us. It, you know, and we share... that. The, the way it gets tricky is we uh, share custody of my dog, who she has stolen from me. <laughs> But there was a time that the two of you didn't get along so well. When I was an adolescent. If you get along with your mother and you're an adolescent, your father is that guy Jeff playing golf and I don't yeah. know you. I mean, it's standard stuff. And again, because we're show business people, because we're bigger, we did the Sanders stuff louder, bigger, you know, yeah. more for the neighbors. But it was the same stuff. Something else I need to ask you about before we run out of time, which is just kind of a guilty pleasure of mine. Mm -hmm. The Star Wars Christmas special. <laughs> it seems to is be the, the coveted, desired thing of all collectors. No. Oh, yeah. Well, you know what I did? I did something. George asked me to do something. I forget what it was. Something that was annoying. Like, a, <laughs> you know, a voiceover introduction yeah. of one. Of, and so I said, I'll do it if you give me that. And so he gave it to me, and we had a party. And we showed it, and it was so bad, it's not funny. <laughs> so I don't know why collectors want it. Just to be able to say, say they, they have, have it. something, yeah. No, it's, it's so bad, it's not funny. You have to keep leaving and coming back. or It's it's funnier to tell what's in it, kind of. Jefferson Airplane. Uh, <laughs> why do you it, get a Wookiee for Christmas? Wookiee Life Day. It's not Christmas. Oh. It's Wookiee Life Day. It's but just bad in every direction. <laughs> It's hilarious, and we're all in there. Are you surprised the staying power that all of this has had? I know you say you're not surprised it was successful, but that today people still are interested in it. Does that surprise you? Things don't surprise me at much at all. I mean, I'm getting that feel. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's interesting, but it doesn't surprise me. Certainly with the way celebrity is organized now or the entertainment or you know, the 24-hour news cycle that we have or whatever it is, people like spectacle, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, th these were the fairy tales of whatever generation that was or is. And and that's what people are looking for, I think, fables and things that the children always had that, that, that comforted them. I had read somewhere that you had said at one point, you wish you hadn't done the role. I never, people well, want me to say that. <laughs> No. no, I would okay. rather have been Harrison on Solo's part was the best one. So no, they want me to say it, so there's something perverse in me that won't. Right. Because it's, it's when did you stop beating your wife? Okay, let me ask a different spin, though, on the question. If you could have placed it at a different point in your career, would you have? Now. Yeah, I want to do the swing you across do... now in the metal bikini. <laughs> now. Yes, I would have done it now. But it was so big, so quick in your career. That that's why sure, I there's the other question. ways things could have happened that it would have been easier on me, but nothing was ever easy on me. Yeah. So if you're going to have something be rough on someone, probably should be me, because, you know, I'm there anyway, <laughs> taken. So, you know, uh, what is that called? A laboratory, a lab rat. So you might as well do it to me. So they did it to me. 
But yeah, it would have been easier to get all this stuff later so that you, oh, I know, I should save money, right? Oh, God. So, you know, those are the things you learn, but that's not peculiar to, to Star Wars. Right. Or is it? <laughs> <laughs> now, you do say in the show that you go to fan conventions and, and wander those and enjoy that. Do you still do that? Sometimes, yeah, I do it. It's, that is really weird. But yeah, sure. And, and look, the weird, if I think something's weird, it's got to be amazing. It's got to be out there. So that's really weird, yeah. So what are you working on now? I'm always mm. curious, where is this talent going next? To the funeral museum here in town. There is a funeral museum in uh, yeah. Houston. And there's a beer house. And I'll probably buy some more cigarettes. I've, d I've done an adaptation of The Best Awful for Meg Ryan, so we're trying to get that done finally after years and years and years. Uh, and after I finish here, I'm going to start, I have a screenplay I want to do, and I'm going to start another book, so. Well, and thank I have a daughter. You. And you have a daughter. Well, yes. Thank you so much for all of the entertainment, the joy, and the stories you've given us. And the, the sorrow. Years. And the, the sorrow. sorrow. Well, the sorrow comes I've with the joy. I've given you my sorry so that you would take it away. Well, I've taken it back. Mary Fisher, right. thank you so much. Thank you.